chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. Cold turkey may be great on sandwiches, but as far as for bad habit breaking, I'm here to tell you there's a better way. And no, we're not talking about hypnosis or making a blood oath with your kooky neighbor. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello there, listeners. I'm Eric Peabody, and you've managed to find your way back to Horror Hill. Now that you're here, I don't think you'll be leaving anytime soon, but luckily, we have a nice creepy story to keep you entertained. Tonight, we'll be reading Jacob's Performance by Lucretia Vastea. The Jacob in question is a talented young actor, and fortunately, he has two very supportive parents. They're so supportive, in fact, that they've made Jacob the star of a little performance they put on from time to time. Unlike many independent acting troops, Jacob and his family are guaranteed a nice payday from every show, because their money doesn't come from ticket sales or anything like that. No, it comes from defaulted rental payments, generously, uh, donated by the tenants that they frighten out of an apartment building. But today, things aren't going as planned, and it seems that something else might be occupying their usual haunting ground. Also, we have Rissa Montañez joining us tonight, providing the voices of Esther and Denise. Please join me in welcoming her to the show. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author Lucretia Vastea, I give you Jacob's Performance.
Liam could see droplets of water falling to meet asphalt at the end of the underpass. Finally, he thought. Rain had been threatening their town for the past two days, but the dark clouds were all bark and no bite. Liam minded neither sunny nor rainy weather, but a sky that promised downpour and refused to deliver was extremely annoying. It was Mother Nature's middle finger in the face of regretfully postponed outdoor activity. Liam was grateful that Esther went to buy the stuff herself this time around. Not because he disliked the rain, but because he never knew what to get, even when the wife exerted her legible handwriting in creating a shopping list. She was still playing in a loop inside his head whenever he thought about the last time she entrusted him with purchasing cosmetics. Titanium white is not the same as silver, (laughs) you doofus. (laughs) No, it wasn't. Liam was grateful Esther went to buy the stuff herself for the first minute or two. Once the crunching and rustling started, the wife's bellowing remarks about his chromatic handicaps didn't seem so bad anymore. He parked far enough in the underpass to hear the rain hitting the floor two feet ahead of the car's muzzle, but the soothing pitter-patter was no match for aluminum foil, or whatever that bag of chips was made of. It was all noise, noise, noise with his kid. Buddy. Liam looked into the rearview mirror. His eyes met with those of a pale little boy sitting in the back seat. Do you mind? The boy stared at Liam with corneas as dark as the faux leather he sat on. What? The chips. You're distracting. The boy frowned, making every black capillary on his forehead point between his eyebrows. But I'm hungry. You should have been hungry half an hour ago when your mother and I asked you to eat with us. I don't like beef stew. That's too bad. You're having beef stew for dinner. The boy's ghostly face crumpled and bent forward as he raised a hand to rub his left eye. Liam took note of his wife's dark figure approaching the car. Don't cry, Jake. I won't force you to eat beef stew if you really don't want to. I'm not crying. Esther opened the car door just in time to catch her son's answer. Who's crying? Nobody's crying. She then climbed into the back seat next to the boy and emptied the bag she was carrying into the space between them. Once he spotted the chocolate among the various tools and colorful bottles, Jacob emitted an excited yelp. Liam sighed heavily. Essie, what the hell? He didn't eat lunch and now you're feeding him crap! Jacob rubbed his eye again and blinked several times after he was done. Jacob, you're ruining your makeup! But it's itchy! The mother scoffed and rummaged through her purse to extract the vampire makeup she kept on hand. Jacob eyed the tube with the white paste and the bottle of baby powder with indifferent recognition. Once Esther produced the black casual eye pencil, however, he jerked audibly and backed off until his frame met the car door. No! Ugh, you rubbed it off. We have to. But it's itchy. Liam chuckled. You had salt and crap from the chips on your hand, Jake. No, it was itchy from before. Esther tisked at her son. Yeah, honey, but it's the sclera contacts, not the makeup. Makeup isn't itchy. Not unless it's expired. I didn't put expired makeup on you. Stop being so dramatic. The little boy's black eyes widened to the point where thin lines of milky white were showing. I thought I have to be dramatic. Isn't that why I'm the one with the gunk on his face? Make up your mind, Mom. Liam let out a staccato of laughter. (laughs) Make up your mind. Make up your face. You two are definitely related. Esther opened her mouth to argue with her son, but closed it right back. There was nothing she could say to him that would outsmart his argument, and she needed him to still take her seriously once he reached his teenage years. Esther grabbed the chocolate and held it at Jacob's eye level. If you let me retouch your makeup, I'll let you have as much of this as you like. Essie. Ugh. He'll need the spike in energy, Liam. Spare me. His blood sugar's gonna crash, and he'll fall flat on his face in your brother's attic. Jacob snorted as he unwrapped the chocolate. This isn't my first rodeo, Dad. I'll be fine. You better be. 
Jacob was observing Liam in the rearview mirror with the eye his mother wasn't painting around. The boy stuck out a victorious tongue at his father, and Liam shook his head, not unsmiling. Liam was not Jacob's biological father, but he couldn't have loved him more even if he were. Liam had been around since Jacob could crawl. He was the one who helped feed and clean him as a baby, and he was the one who held Jacob's little hands when he took his first steps. Liam was also better at putting the baby back to sleep when he woke up in the middle of the night, so nobody was surprised that Jacob's first word was Dada. Sure, the boy was aware that he had no genetic ties to his mother's husband, but Liam was the only father he ever knew and needed. And, like any father, Liam understood his son in ways Esther never could. Jacob was at a confusing age. Too old for action figures, too young for dirty magazines. With his inclination towards art, Jacob's interests never fully mirrored those of other boys his age. But the older he got, the more it became clear to Liam that Jacob's mind encompassed a growth most people only acquired in their late twenties, if at all. She seems nice. Jacob was talking to him. What about Liam didn't know? The boy was planting the seed of intrigue, his black eye unblinking and pleading for his father to show interest. Esther asked the question before Liam got the chance to. Who does? A flash of irritation passed over the boy's face, and Liam would have bet his last penny that Jacob wished he and his dad were alone in the car. The blonde lady, Uncle Dave's new tenant. Esther's fingers stopped moving. She leaned back an arm's length away from her son, looking for any signs of a joke. What makes you say that? Jacob shrugged and took another bite of chocolate to give his mouth a good excuse for the lack of explanation. Liam was familiar with the strategy. Jake, what happened? Jacob stopped chewing. The longer he took to reply, the more tense his mother got. She and Liam developed a non-verbal code throughout their marriage, and Liam was giving her the let me handle this look in the rearview mirror. That look was always a blow to her parenting skills, but she knew that nobody could handle Jacob better than her husband. Tell us, bud. Nothing happened. We believe you, but we'd still like to know. Despite being too mature for his age, Jacob still had an excessively bright and colorful view of the world. To him, the whole operation was, first and foremost, an opportunity to practice for drama school, not to mention more time spent with his two favorite people, his parents. In his mind, he was merely a protagonist in a theatrical performance, a collaborator in an elaborate prank. Surely no sane adult would be upset with him for playing Halloween dress-up this early in the season. Besides, he was just playing around in his uncle's attic. No big deal. It had been his uncle's idea to begin with. Concepts such as legal systems and the like were foreign to the 11-year-old. In Jacob's mind, if he were to get caught, the worst that could happen was no TV after 7pm for a week. Therefore, from his perspective... Having to choose between being found out and being scolded was a no-brainer. The lady came up last time. Esther looked like she was about to jump out of her skin. Liam turned briskly and grabbed her hand to keep her grounded, his collected eyes never leaving Jacob's. Did she see you? Yeah, I tried to hide behind a pile of boxes, but she called out to me. Oh my god... Liam shushed the female intervention. Don't shh me. But Esther obliged regardless. Jacob knew better than to try scratching his eyes again, so he closed them hard, hoping that the skin-on-skin -skin contact would somewhat alleviate his discomfort. Esther dug into her bag for a napkin and dabbed the edge of it around her son's charcoal eyeball as he talked to his father. She called out to you? Yeah, she called me Chris. It was weird. She called you Chris? She was shaking and laughing at the same time. Esther stopped dabbing around Jacob's eye to look at her husband. Her forefinger wiggled in circles at her temple, and Liam shrugged in response. Did she say anything else? Not really. She just kept calling me Chris and that everything was going to be okay. What happened then, buddy? She was getting too close, so I opened my mouth. 
You talked to her? Oh, no, I just opened my mouth. The lady got scared and ran back down. Then I escaped through the dumbwaiter. Liam raised an eyebrow. Esther produced a jar of black goo from her purse. I paint the inside of Jacob's mouth before letting him into the house. Ugh, why? What do you mean, why? Have you ever seen an undead child with teeth as white as these? If you put it that way, I've never seen an undead child. Liam looked at Jacob and the boy flashed him his pearly whites. But you're raising a valid point. Jacob chuckled, although his dad didn't reciprocate the good mood. Why didn't you tell us before? I didn't want you to be upset with me. You have to tell us these things, Jake. I didn't hear her come up. If I did, I would have left sooner. Even so, if it happens again, tell us right away. Jacob hit his thighs with his fists, and the chocolate bounced out of his grasp. Why do I have to wear this getup if nobody can see it? You're not supposed to show it off, silly. It's a precautionary measure. It doesn't make any sense. I was supposed to show myself when Mr. Bell lived there. You told me to run down the hall and make a scene of it. Mr. Bell wore glasses with really thick lenses. It wasn't as risky. Oh, yeah? How about the time I had to knock on the kitchen window while Miss Chestnut made tea? She wasn't wearing any glasses and she got a good look at my face before she fainted. It was dark outside. She didn't live alone, though. Added risk. Cats don't count. Jacob pouted and hit his thighs again. Liam wasn't budging. This is serious, Jacob. Be careful. The woman already saw you once. She shouldn't have, but it happened, and it can't happen again, all right? The tenants from before were old, slow and naive. This one's young and perceptive, and she's not allowed to know who we are and what we do. We'll be in big trouble if she finds out, especially your mom and I. Do you want that? Jacob's theory in regards to being found out was unperturbed. Even so, he shook his head, regardless of the dismissive huff bubbling in his chest. Good. Now, this is what's going to happen. Your mother will sneak into the basement. Make sure the coast is clear before you climb into the dumbwaiter. Use the third one, Jake. This is important. The second one is too loud, and we don't want you to get caught, all right? Use the third one. You need to remember this. Jacob rolled his eyes. It was one time, Dad. Yeah, one time too many. Liam grabbed the small gym bag resting by his feet and threw it in Jacob's lap. There's a marker in there, too. Write a three on your hand so you don't forget. I won't forget. Jake? What's this junk for, anyway? The gym bag contained numerous small objects, from toys to trinkets. Once you're in the attic, I need you to drop an item down the shafts of the first and second dumbwaiter every five minutes or so. Why? Just do it, all right? But be careful. And, as always, as soon as you hear someone coming up, hide. Either behind the trapdoor in the bookshelf or the dumbwaiter. The third one. Don't forget. Jacob pouted anew. Can I at least laugh in the walkie-talkie we planted in the second bedroom? Absolutely not. Why not? I renewed the batteries before she moved in. We should use it while it still works, right? I said no, Jacob. This sucks. Jacob forgot he was still holding onto the gym bag when he hit his thighs again. The hurt made him coil, and it almost made his parents laugh. Almost. I want to act. Cue motherly encouragement. This is also acting, honey. Your part in this is still very important, even though you'll play in the shadows. I don't want to play in the shadows. I want to be the star of the show. The boy tried to give his father the stink eye, which amused Liam to no end. You're having all the fun today. Liam's idea of fun was completely different, but he stuck his tongue out to his son anyway, rubbing retaliation in his face. A smile threatened to break Jacob's anger, but he kept it at bay, like a seasoned master of the hissy fit. Esther checked her watch. Oh god, we have to get going, honey. It's 5.45 and your father is due to arrive at 6. A switch flipped and Jacob put his game face on. 
His mother produced a toothbrush out of her purse and began painting the inside of his mouth with a black goo. As soon as she finished, Jacob forgot all about his annoyance and the itchiness curling around the left half of his visual field. The boy pulled his hoodie up and followed his mother out of the car. I'll be right back. Esther, too, hid her face in the confines of her parka's hood. In the meantime, get dressed. Liam opened his coat's high neck to reveal the black collar underneath. The stiff black collar had a square white patch sewn over his Adam's apple. That's already been taken care of, darling. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. Our sponsor, Fume, looks at things in a different way. Instead of completely erasing your undesirable habits, why not just remove the bad elements from them? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. I was curious myself at first and found myself pleasantly surprised by the flavors. Whether you enjoy a classic mint flavor or the fresh zest of a grapefruit, something harder to come by in the winter months, Fume has you covered. Fume is fresh, delicious air at your fingertips with no harsh smells left behind on your hands, breath, and clothing. Also, Fume is made naturally. There's no electricity needed, which makes the places you can take it limitless. You get what I'm saying. Instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easier. Fume mouthpieces come with an adjustable airflow dial and are designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting. This provides your fingers with an opportunity to fidget, which is helpful for de-stressing and taking the edge off while stepping away from that negative habit. I really enjoy how the shape and quality of the real wood piece is super sleek, fancy-looking, and light. And because it's flavored, vaporized air and not harmful or altering chemicals, you can enjoy your fume with you on the go. Stopping is something that we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and can even be fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Keep your mouth busy and your conscience clean. Not all habits have to be bad for you. Let's create better ones together. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Liam rang the bell three minutes before 6 p.m. He expected to be greeted by a stranger, but the person who answered the door was none other than David, his brother-in-law. Good evening, father. David winked, and Liam had to fight the urge to nudge him aside. The fight was victorious thanks to the blonde lady observing them from the foot of the staircase further down the hall. Good evening, Mr. Lombardi. I didn't expect to see you here. He meant it. David didn't mention that he'd be joining them and blessing the house. Sometimes the tenants wanted their landlord present, other times they preferred speaking to the priest alone. Whichever the case, the complaint was always the same. The tenant would moan to the landlord about the strange activity in their new home. The landlord, a skeptic willing to help regardless, would offer the contact information of either a priest he knew or a well-respected clairvoyant. Esther made one hell of a clairvoyant. She practiced quivering lips and terrified eyes in the mirror three times a week in spite of the seldom requests for her assistance. Most tenants opted for a visit from the priest, and although Liam didn't think of himself to be as talented as his wife and son, the power his words had over the strangers he chased out of their leases was surprising, even to him. If what they were doing wasn't butchering the law, Liam would almost call it a family business. One time, however, David's tenant didn't contact his landlord regarding the strange occurrences, but sought help independently. 
He brought a self-proclaimed shaman into his new home, requesting the premises be inspected for bad energy. To David's infinite luck, said shaman was a nutjob who felt the presence of evil as soon as he stepped over the threshold. David's tenant moved out the very next day and didn't even bother to ask to buy his lease out. The rent kept on coming for the duration of his year, even though David rented and parted with two more tenants while collecting the money in parallel from that silent and compliant victim. The house was grand, unique, and above everything, old. David's spiel was all about selling his future victim the idea that they were renting an historical monument, part owned by the city hall. This meant the tenants were not allowed to carry out any sort of changes to the infrastructure or even the decorum of the house. Replacing the furniture the house came with was allowed, as long as the original furniture was stored in an adequate place and put back once the lease ran out. Nevertheless, under no circumstances were the lamps and wallpaper to be replaced. When David bought the house, the dumbwaiters were nothing but hollow tunnels in the walls, reminiscent of a bed and breakfast operating in the second half of the 20th century. They connected the basement to the attic and were by far the heftiest investment David made in his new building. All three cabins were made of sturdy metal, and despite each of them coming with a safety brake, David insisted the cables supporting cargo of up to 200 pounds weren't going to be strong enough for his dumbwaiters intended purposes. The workers who installed the lifts gave their client really funny looks when he requested they install call buttons not only in the basement and the attic, but also inside the cars themselves. And if that request raised eyebrows, having them create a separate power box just for the dumbwaiters, independent from the house's main one, had them speculating with each other for weeks. Alas, as with any aspect of David's life, the stars above favored him because the workers never uttered a word to anyone about the sketchy house. And if David paid them extra to keep it that way, he was simply adorning his luck with a warranty. The first thing David did once the dumbwaiters were finished was to grab a crowbar and tear the button panels out of the walls in both the basement and attic. Unfortunately, this action rendered the first dumbwaiter unusable, but the other two were handled perfectly. When David showed his handiwork to his accomplices, Esther thought her brother had lost his mind. Liam, on the other hand, was impressed. Nothing said out of order better than dozens of mangled cables spilling out of a bunch of holes in the wall, and if anybody tried the buttons in the elevators themselves, they would find them unresponsive, because nobody other than David's family knew about the separate power box. Long story short, if little Jacob wasn't haunting the attic, that power box was switched off at all times. I arrived ten minutes ago. Miss Connolly wanted me here. The cockiness with which David said that did not go unnoticed. Liam gave him a rigid smile and stepped inside, going over his mental catalog of mannerisms appropriate for a priest stepping into a home he wasn't supposed to be familiar with. The lady watching from the end of the entryway had her arms braided beneath her bosom, with the appendages of one hand ending between her teeth. Liam gave the tenant a curt nod to acknowledge her presence. She stopped the nail-biting briefly to return the greeting. Liam had been in the house more times than he would have liked, but he remained meticulous about the micro-gestures that would marshal the tenant's first impression of him. He advanced slowly and looked around with practiced curiosity. May I take your coat, Father? The lady paused the nail-biting, but she was playing with the tips of her fingers in a dead giveaway that she couldn't wait to get back to it. Yes, please. Miss Connolly approached to help him out of his coat. It was obvious that she tried to look presentable for the expected company, but took the said decision at the last possible minute. Her sweater was inside out, and the zipper at the back of her silhouetted skirt was resting on her right hip, making the geometry of the garment awkward and unflattering. And yet, beneath the layer of sleeplessness, Miss Connolly was a pleasant-looking woman. Would you like some coffee? Or perhaps tea? Thank you. Tea sounds lovely. I'll take a coffee. Thanks. Miss Connolly did not look at David, but nodded at both requests before turning to put Liam's coat away. Once she was out of sight... Liam gave David a look to which David responded with two thumbs up. 
Liam sometimes forgot that his non-verbal talk was only understood by his wife, because those thumbs up were in no way, shape, or form an adequate response to what he was trying to say. Liam's relationship with David was like that of cats with water. He knew he'd survive the bath, but the darn experience couldn't end quickly enough. Miss Connolly called out from the kitchen. The drinks will be ready in a moment. That's all right, Denise. Take your time. David looked pleased with himself for having addressed Miss Connolly by her first name. He stepped into Liam's personal space and whispered with the caution of a nanny during nap time. I met Essie and the kid at the trap door. I let him in. The trap door was a window, but Liam was not in the mood to correct his brother-in-law. He nodded, knowing full well that Jacob would have managed to get into the house even without the help from his uncle. He looks so good. That white skin, those black eyes and veins, almost scared the shit out of me. Yeah, he looks terrifying. Essie's skills are no joke. You can say that again. Something crashed in the kitchen, followed by a curse and a prompt apology. David was the first to react. Are you okay, Denise? I'm fine. I just broke a mug. I'll be right back. There was the distinct sound of a door closing, shutting Miss Connolly off from the rest of the house. Just to be sure, David continued to whisper. By the way, the gym bag was a great idea. The brat threw something down one of the elevator shafts before you got here, and that shit sounded like scratches in the walls. Scratches, dude. This broad was livid. You should stop calling him that. Huh? Your nephew. He has a name, you know. David waved the observation off as if it materialized into a bug. If this shit goes right, starting tomorrow, I'll call him anything he wants. Even Chris. Cold goosebumps trickled down Liam's arms. What did you just say? What? You just said you'd call him Chris. Why would you call him Chris? David shrugged and backed off a little. Denise thinks the brats are dead son. Liam felt his insides drop into his feet. The door to the kitchen opened. I apologize. I'm out of sugar. I hope agave nectar is all right. The sound of porcelain placed on glass beckoned the two men to advance into the sitting room. Liam found it surprisingly bare. The living room, alongside the rest of the house, was intimidatingly spacious. It was not uncommon for the new tenants to not have finished unpacking and decorating their new home, to the allowed extent, before Liam's family began terrorizing them, but this little aesthetic adjustment was unusual, especially for a woman, prejudices be damned. The sitting room looked just like he remembered after he and Essie finished renovating it. The house came fully furnished, carpeted, and curtained, because in David's mind, filling the premises with things that looked and smelled old gave his city hall excuse some credibility. There had been tenants in the past who voiced wanting to store some of the bulkier pieces of furniture in the attic, but none stuck around long enough to do so. Miss Connolly pushed an upholstered bench by the coffee table and went back into the kitchen to retrieve a chair. She positioned the chair to face the bench with the glass table in between and sat on it as her visitors came closer. To Liam's displeasure, he had to touch thighs with his brother-in-law. As the two men sat down on the bench, Miss Connolly remembered her manners and got up again. Here is your tea, father. Liam's tea smelled of coffee. Miss Connolly was in dire need of a full night's sleep. Not wanting to make a scene, Liam grabbed the mug out of his brother-in-law's hand and handed him his own mug as a replacement. Miss Connolly gasped. <gasps> oh dear, I messed up, didn't I? <sighs> oh. The woman dropped her head into her hands. Her elbows met the table with too much force. Miss Connolly then twisted her palms into her orbital sockets, giving off the impression that her eyeballs came unscrewed. I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me. That could happen to anybody, ma'am. I'm tired all the time, but I can't sleep. Ever since I moved here. Just tired. All the time. I understand. I'm sleepy when I stand and alert when I lay down. It's torture. As soon as she finished speaking, there was a metallic clang within the wall expanding to the entryway. 
The pewter spork from the gym bag, Liam was sure. Miss Connolly flinched. <gasps> Did you hear that? The question was addressed to David. David looked over his shoulder to mask the smirk that was creeping on his face. He turned back around as soon as he regained control over his facial muscles. Hear what? The noise. It came from over there. Miss Connolly pointed at the spot she stood earlier when the priest arrived. The stairs were mostly hidden from view due to the wall adjacent to the one connecting the living room to the entryway, but even so, the axis of her finger created a bullseye on the bottom of the stairs. Or, in no uncertain terms, on the lower end of the second dumbwaiter's trajectory. It sounded like, but those don't work, do they? Pardon? The small elevators, those lifts they use for food. Oh, no, the dumbwaiters haven't worked in years. Huh. It's probably just the house settling down. And so it began. David, the landlord, had to deny that there was anything wrong with his property. He never saw, heard, or knew of anything unusual to have happened in the house. Liam and Esther, on the other hand, had to go in the opposite direction. Albeit playing different characters, the two of them had the same script to abide by. First, they were to pretend everything seemed normal. If possible, they had to add a flair of condescension in their questioning to make the tenant feel ridiculous for thinking they were being tormented by forces from another world. Once the tour of the house ensued and they reached the first floor, both the priest and the clairvoyant had to succumb to a colossal sense of fear. Their stunt included shaky legs, supporting themselves upright with the help of walls or balusters, clutching their chests, heavy breathing, dry coughing, and tremor assertions of something pure evil being present. Miss Connolly laughed the way people laugh when they hear bad news and refuse to acknowledge them. You think I'm crazy? Not a question. You think I'm seeing things because I'm hurt and vulnerable and alone in this big, cold nightmare of a house. Technically, nobody forced her to sign the lease, but Liam knew better than to verbalize that thought. Or you think I'm making things up for attention. Go ahead, say it. You wouldn't be the first ones. That sentence was worrisome. If Miss Connolly started talking to close ones regarding the house, they were half an hour of Google searches away from a lawsuit. David had been too lucky for his own good. The more people they played, the riskier the game. The past tenants had been older, quirky individuals who found technology snobby and exhausting. They were mostly artists who wanted to enjoy their retirement by creating as many beautiful things as possible. They saw it as their last chance at gaining some immortality before their meat costume quit its job. Those people found relief in the unvarnished building and saw more potential in a landline than an internet connection. Miss Connolly was an exception. She wasn't what a 20-year-old would consider young, but she was too young to fall in the age category of David's preferred targets. What's more, Miss Connolly looked tired, not stupid. Ten hours of sleep for her could mean a lengthy prison sentence for the two men, and if they weren't careful, it could mean the same for Essie. It was anybody's guess what would happen to Jacob if it came to that. Who said you're making things up? Miss Connolly waved Liam off and took a sip of coffee, despite the challenge presented by her trembling hands. I complain I can't sleep, and yet, here I am, chugging caffeine by the gallons. She laughed and took another sip, like her conscience and her motor skills were two different entities. When you're that tired, they probably are. Miss Connolly, I heard from Mr. Lombardi that you've been experiencing some... Uh, peculiar activity within this house. Miss Connolly hid the lower half of her face behind her mug. Is that how he put it? Hmm? Peculiar activity? David let out a nervous chuckle. <laughs> Come on, it is kind of weird, isn't it? Not to me, it isn't. Not once did the woman look away from the priest, not even when she addressed her landlord. Liam didn't dare speak. And David, thankfully, opted to keep quiet as well. Miss Connolly made both of them feel like they were undergoing a test and failing miserably. I don't know what Mr. Lombardi told you so far, Father, but I assure you, 
Whether either of you believe me or not, the activity within this house can be explained. There was a knowledge in her eyes that had Liam cling to the cushion of his seat. There was something in the air charging its power from the uneasiness building in his chest. I once had a child, father. A baby boy. He was supposed to turn ten last week. I say supposed to because he died two years ago. Liam felt disgusting. My husband and I, we... Miss Connolly's face contorted momentarily, but she diverted the incoming emotion by concentrating on her bitten nails scratching at the golden rim of her mug. We tried working things out, but apparently, till death do us part, was an omen. Liam knew that, even in his disguise, reaching out and taking Miss Connolly's hands in his would be deemed inappropriate. Regardless, the mere thought of ever losing Jacob made him want to hold the grieving woman until she cried herself empty. I used to call out to Chris. The brothers-in-law forgot themselves briefly and exchanged a glance. After he passed away, I asked for a sign that he was still around. Anything. She rolled her eyes at her past self, letting the men know that she was aware of how outrageous it all sounded. Bryce didn't like it when I talked about him. Bryce? My husband. Ex, I mean. He told me to let go. He said I was hurting him. The mockery in her tone was heavy. Another faint chime came from the foot of the stairs, but Miss Connolly was too engulfed in her memories to notice it. Me? Hurt him? (laughs) I still had to work while he got himself fired for drinking on the job. Day in and day out, he was passed out drunk in our living room while the DVD player was running on a loop with everything we ever recorded of our son. Birthday parties, vacations, silly things that he said or did, but all of a sudden, me mentioning Chris was too much for him. The hypocrite. A speckle of gold came off the rim of Miss Connolly's mug from her constant scratching. I suggested therapy. Bryce wouldn't hear it. So I had to do whatever I could to keep myself sane. I began talking to Chris. What would you like for dinner? It's half past seven. Time for bed, young man. Thank you for the wonderful drawing, honey. Mommy loves it. He wasn't there, of course. I wasn't hearing voices or anything. I just... I just couldn't cope with the thought that he was... gone. Miss Connolly's eyes filled with tears as her fingers clenched around something non-existent. Bryce heard me one time. I didn't hear him coming. Who the hell are you talking to? He asked. Stop that. You're freaking me out. (sighs) He left not long after that. But that doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is... I think... The tendons in Miss Connolly's neck strained against her skin. I think I called my son back from the dead. And now he followed me, here, and is playing in the attic. Liam's stomach contracted whilst David saw dollar signs. It was Liam's turn to speak, and he hated every incoming syllable. Miss Connolly, I'm not sure of what's going on in this house, but I can't promise that whatever's bothering you will go away if I bless the place. Miss Connolly jumped in her seat. I don't want him to go away. David's dollar signs disappeared. He leaned towards Miss Connolly as if the distance between her mouth and his ears was distorting his perception. You want the ghost to stay? In the house? With you? Miss Connolly looked at her landlord like he had just peed on her carpet. The ghost is my baby. Well, yeah, maybe, but still, it doesn't belong here, does it? Liam grabbed David's knee as discreetly as he could, hoping his brother-in-law would get the message and shut his mouth before the situation got out of control. Funny you should say that, Mr. Lombardi. Until now, you referred to my son's spirit as the house settling down, the weather, or my uneasy nerves. Well, you did say you... Please. Liam cut both of them off. Fighting will bring us nowhere. Everybody's on edge. This is an unusual situation for all of us, so let's just try to calm down and approach this like adults. The tension wasn't high enough to justify the priest's outburst, but Liam was scared of what David was about to say. Miss Connolly resumed peeling the gold foil off of her coffee mug. 
David looked like he wanted to smash that same mug against the wall. I must have misunderstood why you requested me here, Miss Connolly. If I can't bless the place, please tell me what it is you'd like me to do. The woman bit her lip and sagged her shoulders. David held his breath. I don't know. I tried talking to him to see why he can't rest in peace. This behavior is unusual for him. Chris was a quiet child. He liked to read and watch cartoons. Sure, he ran around sometimes, but never like this. He was never this noisy. It's like he's either trying to catch my attention or... It was Liam's turn to hold his breath. Scare me. David nudged Liam with his leg, and it was only then that Liam realized his hand still had a death grip on his brother-in-law's knee. I just want to know what he wants. Will you try talking to him, father? Mr. Lombardi said he knows a psychic, but you never know with those people. Liam saw no other possibility. The situation came with a twist rivaled by nothing he was prepared for, so he had no choice but to redirect Miss Connolly's hunch. Miss Connolly... Would you like a glass of cognac? I would, said David. Liam raised a hand to prevent Miss Connolly from leaving the table. My apologies, but I don't think that would be a good idea. You will in a moment. Neither man expected that retort. Liam thought the heavy feeling in his gut couldn't get any heavier, but then came the distinct sound of dysfunctional machinery from right behind him. In other words, it emerged five feet away from where it was supposed to come from. The second dumbwaiter. The loud one. Miss Connolly looked unsure whether to address the noise or resume doing what she intended to initially. She hugged herself and stepped away from the table, looking like her mind and voice box didn't agree on what was to be said next. I have to show you something. She walked briskly towards the stairs, not looking behind herself to make sure the men were following. David whispered through his teeth as soon as Miss Connolly was out of earshot. His breezy attitude from before had vanished. He was fuming. This is bullshit. I don't think we'll chase her off like the rest of them. I don't care. She needs to go. I need this broad out of here by next week. I have a new tenant lined up. Miss Connolly was already halfway up the stairs when the brothers-in-law left the table in her pursuit. I'm sorry about Jake. I told him not to use the second dumbwaiter. I'm feeding him beef stew for the rest of the year. David gave Liam a confused look, which, combined with his anger, made him look like he was about to strike him. What the hell are you talking about? Oh, he hates beef stew. This afternoon, he... Forget the stew, man. Why would you tell him not to use the second dumbwaiter? David was far from being sensible, but he was even further from being dumb. Sure, he would know something must have gotten stuck in one of the sheaves of the second dumbwaiter. Either that or the traction motor was dying. The lift was loud, and it sounded too mechanical to be mistaken for paranormal activity. Are you insane? You want to be found out? No, but we have to drive her crazy. David's eyes bulged as he whisper-sneered that last word. If this bitch decides to hang around, to contact her dead kid, I'm sending her to him myself. Liam shook at the sound of that. The thought of being on the same team with a person who'd mutter something so heartless made him sick to his stomach. They reached the stairs, but took their time in ascending. I need your boy to be as loud as a fucking college party in hell. Wait, there was a walkie-talkie in the guest bedroom. Is it still there? And the lights? Yeah, Jake told me he changed the batteries last time. Good. I need to get to that thing somehow. Tell Jacob to make as much noise as he can. I sure as hell can't trust you with it. With each stair that got him closer to the first floor of the house, Liam's head felt like he was rising tens of miles above the ground. Listen... David and Liam were high enough to see the open door to the master bedroom and Miss Connolly's shadow stretching from within on the hallway floor. David turned to Liam with flaring nostrils, which was overkill because he was standing on a higher step and it was making them more prominent anyway. Don't tell her I told you this, but you're better at this than my sister. You're believable. But that's not going to cut it this time. 
Al, I need you to go Oscar nominee ape shit. Grab at your hair, fall to your knees, pretend to pass out if you fucking have to. Scare the living shit out of her. She has to go. Do you understand? David resumed his way toward the master bedroom before Liam had the chance to answer. Liam went through his memorized script as quickly as he could, thinking about which parts needed tweaking and which needed dramatic embellishment to make David happy. A happy David was a generous David, and judging by the anger he was displaying, there was a big profit to be claimed if Miss Connolly moved out as quickly as possible. Liam walked very slowly as he made mental bullet points for the act he was about to deliver. There was an evil spirit in the house. In the original script, the spirit thought the tenant was the family member who killed them, which is why they were hungry for revenge. That story wouldn't fly this time around. If anything, it would probably strengthen Miss Connolly's resolve to hang around and try soothing things over with her dead son. No. Liam had to convert Jacob's performance into something other than a dead son. Miss Connolly had to believe that the specter running around in the attic was not Chris, but someone else. Something else. It had to become anything else so that she would move out, regardless of her lease. Once he entered the master bedroom, however, every single mental note vanished. Liam grabbed onto the doorframe for stability. David had his back turned to his tenant, so she wasn't aware of the face-splitting grin he was serving Liam. David regaining his positive mood was both a good and a bad sign. Liam decided it was a good sign. He needed it to be. Everything else was just a heap of bad signs, piling over one another like they were competing to be the straw that broke the camel's back. If either he or Miss Connolly was the camel in the given circumstances... Liam couldn't say. What in God's name is this? David's newfound euphoria added two octaves too many to his tone. Miss Connolly's crumbling psyche could have done without them. I've never seen this before. But David knew what it was, of course, and so did Liam. Miss Connolly was shaking. It was beneath the wallpaper. She rooted herself in the center of the room to be equally far away from all four walls. She hugged herself with her chin tucked in, making it all too clear why she mentioned brown alcohol before coming up. The wallpaper had the color and structure of wet parchment, and it was ripped and scattered everywhere around Miss Connolly's feet. The scene looked like the worst present to have ever been unwrapped. There was writing carved into the walls. There was so much of it and it was so dense that most of it was illegible. The sentences clear enough to be read promised torture, suffering, and rocking people like hurricanes. Liam knew this because he himself, alongside Esther and their son, had needed two whole weeks to engrave the messages into the walls. They did it in both the master bedroom as well as in the study by the stairs leading to the attic. The trio had run out of ideas mere days into their sculpting assignment. It was a good thing that Miss Connolly was too unnerved by the few gruesome warnings written in big letters to read the smaller carvings. She would have been surprised to find not only song lyrics, but also recipes and knock-knock jokes among the swearing and curses. The inscriptions had been there since before their first-ever victim moved in. The terms in the contract were clear. The interior design was not to be messed with, and that was exactly why David had Liam's family do some chiseling before covering it up with the most hideous mustard-colored wallpaper to ever exist. He was stingy with the adhesive around the edges to push his luck, but despite that, no tenant before Miss Connolly uncovered the horrors underneath. Saying that David had dollar signs in his eyes again was an understatement. This is coming out of your safety deposit. Liam was never one to resort to violence, but that sentence made him want to pummel David's face in. Miss Connolly looked insulted. You think that's what I care about right now? She was by no means a petite woman, but the way she stood in the middle of the room, slouched over the embrace she gave herself, 
Ms. Connolly looked like a stricken bird in a frail attempt at protecting itself from an incoming blow. My son tells me hell's in this house, and you think I care about my safety deposit? She was quoting one of the testimonies on the wall. Ms. Connolly. Liam detached himself from the door frame, only to grab onto the solid wooden chest against the wall next to it. Father, are you okay? On her way to the priest, Miss Connolly pushed the wallpaper aside with her feet. She looked like she wanted to touch him, which made Liam regain his balance instantly. If anybody needed support or consolation, it was Miss Connolly herself, and the fact that the woman showed any concern for him at all made him even more repulsed by what he was doing. Father, you are very pale, and you're shaking. Without warning, Miss Connolly grabbed Liam's hand and gasped at its coldness. Behind her, David was giving Liam a chef's kiss followed by a thumbs up for what he deemed to be his best performance yet. Except, Liam wasn't acting. Miss Connolly, this is not your son's doing. This is an old spirit. Evil. Old evil spirit. It wants to hurt you, Miss Connolly. No, father, you don't understand. I saw him. Two days ago, I saw him in the attic. It's my boy. It's Chris. Miss... Uh, Miss Connolly, it's not. But I saw him. You saw somebody else. David's face fell, as did his thumb. Liam wasn't done. You saw another... Miss Connolly frowned, some of her earlier strength seeping back to replace the distress on her face. Another what? Spirit? Liam felt like he was halfway into lifting 200 pounds. He nodded. Do you recognize the spirit, Father? And then, apprehensively... Have you been here before? I think the Father needs a drink of water. David took Liam's hand out of Miss Connolly's and nearly dragged him out of the room. Excuse us. But... Stay here, Denise. We'll be back in a second. Miss Connolly watched her landlord drag the priest in the direction they had come from. The two men passed by the stairs and entered the guest bathroom at the end of the hall. The guest bathroom had undergone the most recent renovation. Everything was spotless, which was not to say that it was necessarily a good sign. The pipes crisscrossing to and through unused bathrooms could get moody in the chilly seasons. Liam could breathe again, but the bad feeling got stronger by the minute. What the hell do you think you're doing? David did the whisper shouting thing again, despite having closed the door before opening his mouth. I can't do this anymore, Dave. You can, and you will. For what, Dave? For fucking what? Are you kidding me right now? What do you mean, for what? I upped the rent with this one and got her safety deposit on my hands, which never happened before. You think I'm letting you tap out now? She ripped half-assed wallpaper off the walls. She damaged my property, part owned by the city hall. It's just wallpaper, Dave. She'll sue the second she's out of here, and your city hall shtick will blow to smithereens. David laughed, and it jumped off the cold tiles as if the bathroom was laughing along. She'll never sue. Have you seen her? She's too uptight to make a fool of herself in public. Can you imagine this broad talking about ghosts in court? Besides, for all I know, she carved the walls herself. David was a very convincing liar. It was the sole reason his wife hadn't left him yet. Liam turned to the sink. He didn't dare look at himself in the mirror, fearing he might throw up. Dave, seriously, I have a very bad feeling about this one. Oh, psh, you have a bad feeling about all of them. Wish the broad took a liking to fortune tellers. My sister's not as good as you, but she would have made her sprint out of here by now. Liam cringed so hard, it cost him a conscious effort to keep his lunch down. Listen... David got a foot too close. I need to get to that walkie-talkie. Go back to her and keep her put while I tell the brat to pick it up a notch. His name is Jacob. 
There was the distant sound of an object falling in the hollow passageway of the second dumbwaiter. Whatever. Stop wasting time and do what I'm paying you to do. Make a scene. Freak her out. Tell her she needs to leave the house immediately. Ask her if she has family nearby. Liam opened the faucet, seeking the relief of cold water on his face. Instead, he was greeted with a squeak, a pang, and a pressureless flow of brown muck. Dave, do you see this? David wasn't paying attention. He opened the bathroom door and looked in the direction of the master bedroom. I'm going in. If she asks about me, tell her I need to piss or something. And with that, his brother-in-law disappeared behind the door adjacent to the guest bathroom. David was right, of course. Liam knew what he signed up for. He was supposed to have made peace with the risks of the ploy, and the guilt yanking at his heartstrings was a slap in the face to their previous victims. Liam didn't have the right to develop a conscience. He was biased and, above all, selfish. His family needed the money. The mourning woman ought to be fine without it. An odd sound came from behind him. Knowing the layout of the house, Liam knew that right behind himself was the tunnel concocted for the first dumbwaiter, the defective one. The noise suggested none of the objects Liam had put in the gym bag for his son to discard. If anything, it sounded akin to half a dozen live rats scuttering through the vertical excavation like gravity wasn't a problem. It was evident when David's request reached Jacob. All of a sudden, the drumming in the wall was accompanied by infernal noise from everywhere else. A door squeaked shut on the first floor. Downstairs, the door to the kitchen opened and closed forcefully, as did the doors to various cupboards. Something similar to a medicine ball was falling down the stairs, and as soon as it reached the landing, it hit and broke something. From the sound of it, that something was made of heavy glass. The windows rattled and someone turned a radio on in the basement. There was electronic music coming out of all three channels in the walls. David must have called Esther for reinforcement. To Liam, that was the only explanation for why the uproar had such an unnatural range. The priest impersonator rushed out of the bathroom to make sure Miss Connolly wasn't about to charge downstairs and catch her landlord participating in the commotion. Back in the master bedroom, the woman was still hugging herself. Her eyes were closed, and from the way her lips were moving, Liam could tell that she was trying to listen to the song and decipher the cryptic lyrics. Something about a baby having a temper. Liam held onto the doorframe for support again, and just as he opened his mouth to frighten Miss Connolly some more, his world stopped. The scream was ear-piercing. A powerful thump interrupted it momentarily, but the scream resumed, only to be cut short by another thump. Someone was playing dodgeball in the attic, but the ball was roughly the size and weight of a dishwasher. Miss Connolly charged. She pushed the priest out of the way and, to Liam's dread, ran straight for the stairs leading to the attic. Miss, no, don't go up there! Miss Connolly wasn't listening to anything other than the sounds coming from the attic. The screams spiraled into sobs, and the thumps increased in frequency, albeit not in volume. The chaotic music, stating that the baby has a temper, was still playing within the walls. The furniture downstairs still had a mind of its own. There was another distinct sound of glass breaking. Once Liam was high enough to see the dark attic floor around Miss Connolly's ankles, he noticed two things. One, there was a moaning figure deep in the room, gliding along and throwing its body against the wall as if trying to make the construction give in. Second, Miss Connolly didn't look so sure of wanting to approach the silhouette anymore. Liam stopped next to the woman, and they both observed as the dark figure sobbed and mumbled in its pursuit of an exit in the wall. Once it reached the window, the moaning stopped, giving way to silent weeping. The thing then started to pound its head against the glass with short but powerful motions. The song by the prodigy was blaring from every square inch of the building, and Liam decided he had never hated a band more. 
Jacob sounded hurt and delirious, and it took every fiber of self-control for Liam to not run to him and beg him to stop. C- Chris? Honey? Jacob stopped pounding his head against the glass. With his black mouth agape, he turned his head towards the voice. Once he spotted Miss Connolly, he detached himself from the glass and stepped outside the cone of light cast through the window. He disappeared in the darkness momentarily, and once he reappeared in front of his spectators, Miss Connolly cried out and hid behind the priest. The woman was shaking, but nowhere near as severely as Liam was. Jacob stopped six feet in front of his father. His face was covered in wet stripes going down from his eyes, nose, and even the corners of his mouth. The subtle light creeping in from the open attic door illuminated his pale face, which looked just as white as his washed-off makeup had. Jacob must have lost the battle against his itchy eye because his left contact lens was no longer there. Nevertheless, the bloodshot eye made him look even more gruesome than he had in the car. Liam, of all people, knew Jacob was incredibly gifted. Granted, all parents claimed their offspring to be the best thing since sliced bread, but Liam was certain that once Jacob was old enough to join drama school, he would blow his entrance exam out of the troposphere, and every audition after that. Jacob had been six when Liam first caught him practicing crying in the mirror. Jacob practiced it so thoroughly afterward he could cry on command in under two minutes. Liam knew better than anybody that his boy was a dramatic powerhouse, but he wasn't ready for this performance. Help me! Something pulled Jacob backward by the ankles. The boy fell to the floor, chest first. He screamed bloody murder and clawed at the floorboards as something powerful dragged him to the back of the attic and threw him into the awaiting dumbwaiter. The first one. The one that didn't work at all. As soon as Jacob was inside, the dumbwaiter dropped like the boy weighed a ton. Baby's got a temper continued to play as Jacob screamed along, all the way down to the basement. It was a matter of seconds. Miss Connolly let out a shriek, and so did Liam. Liam wanted to charge forward, but Miss Connolly grabbed him by the forearm and pulled him out of the attic with mammoth force. <gasps> That's not Chris. That's not. You were right, Father. Demons. This place is infested with demons. We need to get out of here. We need to get out of here. <laughs> Somewhere along the way, Miss Connolly let go of him to reach the downstairs faster. I'm not staying another minute in this house. Once Liam got to the ground floor, he watched Miss Connolly scamper to look for her phone, wallet, and car keys. He couldn't see her, though. All he could see was his bellowing son being dragged across a wooden floor. His heart was beating so hard he could feel it inside his head. Despite his paternal instincts roaring at him to get to the basement to see if Jacob was all right, Liam's anatomy suffered so much stress and adrenaline that he felt nailed to the floor. Come on, father! We have to leave! Miss Connolly grabbed her purse and jacket with one hand and Liam's numb arm with the other. Liam showed no resistance as the woman drew him along the entryway and outside the front door. She didn't even bother locking the door, and Liam doubted she remembered her landlord was still inside the house. Miss Connolly let go of his arm and jogged to the vehicle parked mere feet away. Do you do you need a ride, Father? No. The woman moved on autopilot. She was in her car and turned the key in the ignition with no regard to instinctual and social habits, such as encasing seatbelts or formal goodbyes. She backed out of the driveway and drove out of sight as fast as her vehicle allowed. Even so, Liam kept murmuring synonyms for acceleration all the while he could still see her car. Once she had left his field of vision... The pirated priest dashed to the back of the house, where the window to the basement lay open at the level of his feet. He heard him before he saw him. David's laughter. His brother-in-law was having the time of his life. Dude, your face! Where's Jacob? 
Relax, he's fine. Liam dropped to his knees to follow David's line of sight deep into the basement. He could see his son rummaging through various boxes and laughing to himself at the plethora of stuff he was discovering. Buddy? Buddy, are you okay? I'm great. You sure? You screamed. You sounded hurt. The first dumbwaiter... No. You fell on your chest. No. Bud, please talk to me. Come here, I want to take a look at you. I'm a baby with a temper. The boy ignored his father in favor of studying a toy train he found in a wooden chest. It had to be Miss Connolly's. His son looked all right and he sounded fine. Liam was relieved, but that relief came with a crushing headache and an ultimate decision he was about to discuss with his wife. He looks excited. We just pulled off the scheme of the century. Damn right, he should be excited. How did you do it? Pull him in the dumbwaiter and all. What do you mean? I didn't do anything. It was all the little rock star over there. And how the hell is the first dumbwaiter working all of a sudden? Jacob giggled. David shrugged with a lopsided grin. No clue. Maybe it always worked and we just never pushed the buttons hard enough. Liam's brain came up with three refutations on how and why that statement didn't make any sense, but he was too tired to let David play hooky with the last remnants of his tolerance. Jacob dropped the train back into the wooden chest and picked up an object he found on the floor. It was one of the trinkets he threw out of the gym bag. From his vantage point, Liam recognized the keychain he received during a summer festival he volunteered for in college. It was the shiniest thing in the dark basement, and Jacob seemed fascinated by it. These dumbwaiters, man. The acoustics in this house are ridiculous. I expected the broad to scream, but you? David snorted and shook his head in disbelief. You both sounded like little girls! Liam's brother-in-law grimaced and mimicked Liam's distress. It made Jacob laugh. See? Even Jake agrees. The music. Was that you? Of course. Who else could it be? Where's Essie? Huh? Esther. Where is she? David took longer than necessary to process the question. We texted earlier. She's waiting for you in the car. Well, I don't want to keep her waiting. Oh, come on! Call her over. Have a drink with me. We need to celebrate. This one was huge. Tomorrow's a school day. David scoffed in the way that only adults without children scoff at parents who have valid reasons to talk themselves out of everything. Come on, Jake. We have to go, said Liam before turning and walking away. Jacob abandoned the keychain on the basement floor and scurried toward the window. His uncle was happy to help his little star up, and Jacob giggled at the feeling of being hoisted in the air. Yo, L, how's drinks on Saturday sound? Liam was already off the property when his brother-in-law called after him. Drinks with David on a Saturday sounded about as much fun as an iron rod through the skull, so Liam pretended not to have heard him. Jacob was running to catch up to him. Liam slowed down and extended his left hand, inviting the cheerful boy to grab onto it as soon as he was within reach. You scared the daylights out of me, bud. Don't ever do that to me again, okay? Okay. The boy was in such good spirits, Liam had no choice but to suppress the scolding. He was exhausted. Jacob's humming and walking with a skip in his step kept him awake. The rain picked up again once they reached the underpass. Liam opened the door to the back seat to let Jacob inside the car. Esther sat behind the steering wheel, so Liam dropped in the seat next to her, limbs and eyelids heavy with gratefulness at not having to drive. Tell me everything. Esther's excitement brought an ugly shade to his already sour mood. Liam fumbled with a seatbelt to win precious seconds in choosing his words carefully. Letting Essie know that he was ready to go was also part of the plan. Essie wasn't budging, though, and the angle her upper body was twisted at showed no intention of turning keys and ignitions before she got the information she wanted. The lady's moving out. Yeah, David texted me. He's stoked. He didn't think we'd scare this one away at all. It wasn't easy. Is it true? Did she remove the wallpaper? In the master bedroom, yes. 
Esther let out a shrill laugh and covered her mouth with both hands in a failed attempt at muffling the volume. God, I carved at least two grocery lists on those walls. Can you imagine her face if she had read those? (laughs) Esther threw her head against the headrest and let out more waves of wanton laughter. Liam waited for her elation to pass. Usually, he'd join in on her amusement, but his dismay made him immune. As he coughed the last remnants of her laughing fit and rummaged through her purse in search of a napkin, she found the one she used on her son some hours prior, but the black stains made her put it back and reach for a clean one. Dave said he's getting the safety deposit too this time around. Dave says a lot of things. It was only that one room. Everything else is in pristine condition. Who knows what else he might find? He said he can bill her for anything he wants, because it's not like the woman will ever step back into the house, just to confirm he's right. She might send somebody to check for her. Yeah, she might, but I think Dave's got this in the bag. He's good at getting away with this kind of stuff. Too good. Essie dabbed her eyes with the soft paper. Why are you so upset? Dave said it was the best it ever went. I... I don't want to do this anymore. The rain was getting louder. The sound of the drops hitting concrete was faint and overshadowed by the length of the tunnel, but Mother Nature was crying heavily. Why not? The question was in no way accusatory. Essie sounded inquisitive, like someone who wanted to hear all their options before making a decision. There were so many reasons to give. The legality of it, the morality of it, the mental and physical danger they were putting their son in, as well as themselves. But these had all been things they had gone through before, thoroughly at that, and none of them had been disconcerting enough to outweigh the promise of easy monetary reward. Miss Connolly thought Jake was her dead son. Liam heard Essie's heart hammer in her chest alongside the rain pattering outside their metal bubble. That's why Dave thought he wouldn't get rid of her. She wanted to stay in the house, to reach out to him. Is that why she called him? Yes. If you ask me, a part of her was relieved to be given a second chance with her baby. And now, we gave her false hope and took that away from her as well. Oh, Jesus... Essie's mood morphed into Liam's. Liam wasn't sure if he liked it better. That is not what David said to me. I bet it's not. I never would have agreed to this gig if I had known. I know. Ugh, that poor woman. Esther's face drooped in sorrow for her fellow mother. The laughter from before felt like it belonged to a version of her from a parallel universe a universe in which she and her husband weren't traumatizing people for money. She saw it, didn't she? When Jake laughed and jumped in the dumbwaiter? Liam frowned. Yeah, she saw everything. But Jake never laughed. He didn't jump, either. Okay. Dave said he reached Jake via the walkie-talkie and gave him a rundown of what he had to do. He definitely said something about laughing and jumping. Jake must have improvised, then. Which reminds me, how did you do it? Do what? Were you the one dragging Jake or your brother? It couldn't have been your brother, could it? What are you talking about? Who was dragging Jake? Someone dragged Jake by the ankles to the dumbwaiter. It was Esther's turn to frown. Oh no. No, baby. You didn't see right. Jake jumped in the dumbwaiter. Dave told him to. He wasn't dragged. Yes, he was. He said, help me, then screamed his head off while somebody dragged and threw him into the first dumbwaiter. The first? But that one's been broken for years. It's working now. Long story. But, no, no, you're wrong. My brother would never do that. He wouldn't because he's probably too fat for those cars. Was it you? What? You, Esther. When you got to the house to help us with the performance. Where were you? I know you weren't in the basement to play the music. That was David. He told me. You were in the kitchen then, slamming doors and breaking dishes. Esther's mouth opened, but nothing came out. Liam didn't let up. How did you get in the attic without making any noise or being seen? Honey? 
Esther's voice was steady. The rest of her, anything but. Liam felt his heartbeat between his temples. I was here the whole time. And then it hit him. It was all noise, noise, noise with his kid, and yet, despite the terrifying, awe-inducing performance he gave tonight, Jacob was as quiet as he'd only been in his mother's womb. The married pair said nothing as they turned their heads to look at their son. The boy was smiling from ear to ear. He must have found the time to put the left sclera contact back into place somehow, because Jacob was looking at his parents with both orbs as black as a night sky void of moon and stars. His face shone nearly blue in the car's illuminated interior. The multitude of black, branchy veins around his face accentuated his pallor. Jacob looked fine. Jacob had sounded okay back at the house. Jacob didn't show any signs of pain, had walked to the car without a hitch, and his smile looked genuine. However, his mother froze from joints to nerve endings. Liam was also on the brink of a cognitive shutdown, but he still held on to a glimmer of hope. Jake? Liam did not see his life flash before his eyes, but Jacob's. Jacob stirring in his crib. Jacob singing with his mother in the kitchen. Jacob throwing tantrums about beef stew. Jacob being dragged into a dumbwaiter that hadn't worked in years, only to fall to God knows where. The boy kept smiling while slowly shaking his head. Liam's heart hammered in his head like it wanted to crack his skull open. The pounding stopped being sovereign over Liam's hearing just enough for him to mutter his last word. Chris? To that, the boy gave a toothless grin with a mouth as black as his eyes. Esther wanted to say something, but she forgot every prayer she ever knew. Staring into the black mouth that was getting wider and wider by the moment, she even forgot who the prayers were supposed to address. Briefly, both Liam and Esther thought about reaching for the other's hand so they would meet the incoming darkness together. The idea was soon discarded. There is no partnership in death. It's just a romantic notion the living came up with to make the prospect of eternal rest a little more comforting. But eternal rest was not the type of death that awaited Liam and Esther inside that infernal mouth. No, rest was to be had by neither of them ever again. You've been listening to Jacob's Performance by Lucretia Vastea. Lucretia Vastea is an author and artist based out of Germany, whose written works have been adapted to audio by the likes of the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast, the No Sleep podcast, and Otis Gyrie's Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Well, my friends, I'm sorry to say that this concludes our broadcast this evening. I'd like to thank Rissa Montañez again for guesting in tonight's episode, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. I will be back next week with another frightful fable to keep your blood running cold. In the meantime, listeners, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. 
Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Chiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's dark tales, Paul J. McSorley's fear from the heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.